Rob, Colin Kohler was not required to enter a plea in this morning's proceedings. How does Twitter work? Well, you have to first sign up and give yourself a screen name. Mine is Caramac. Now, we did check in with other hospitals, including Maine Medical Center in Portland, Central Maine Medical Center in Lewiston, and Mass General in Boston. And they say that while they don't equip their security guards with tasers, they do sometimes call in police to respond, and sometimes those officers are equipped with tasers. One of the biggest concerns that they have if a buoy is cut is they lose three weeks of data. And in that time, if red tide shows up on shore, they have to close the rest of the bay as well. This mill has seen its ups and downs in the past couple of months. One of the machines went down for the entire month of February, starting back up on March 2nd. Then four weeks later, this announcement came, this time for the entire mill. And again, that's not just for people who live in Bangor, but people who live throughout the county. Members of Bangor City Council are also meeting tonight over at Bangor City Hall, and they're discussing something that they've been discussing for many, many years, consolidating Bangor Police and Fire Dispatch with Penobscot Regional County Communications. But this time, the proposal has a new look. Every day, dispatchers at Penobscot Regional Communication Center take almost 1,000 calls. 150 of them are 911 calls. Soon, the number of 911 calls coming in here could increase dramatically. Jim Ryan, the director at the center, estimates by at least one-third. Bangor City Councilors are discussing a move that would have all of these dispatchers answer Bangor's emergency calls and then transfer them to Bangor Police and Fire as needed. It does not look like there would be any immediate short-term savings because the county would obviously have to staff up, staff up to take our calls. We would still have to retain our own dispatchers to manage the, the response in the field. But Barrett explains there could be long-term savings for the city. The state is looking to consolidate public safety answering points or PSAPs around the state. And at the same time, Barrett says public safety officials have said that there will be more monitoring and training, which if Bangor is not a PSAP, dispatchers would not have to participate in and the city would not have to pay for. No, just more property value. But when Dan Tremble was a Bangor city councilor, he voted down the idea to consolidate the dispatch centers. But now, as county treasurer, he thinks the city should not stop at this new proposal, but instead go for full consolidation. This is a nominal uh, service for Bangor if they switch it, and it's going to increase you know, our cost by a couple hundred thousand. Tremble estimates because the county communications center would have to hire four additional dispatchers, county taxes would go up by 1%, not just in Bangor, but for everyone in the county. Jim Ryan says he knows his dispatchers could handle the increase in calls, but he says they'd most likely be handling more medical calls, calls that require special training. He says no matter what Bangor decides, the center will still be there. We're here. We have a good shop. Uh, I have a good staff. Um, they're very good at what they do. We have the, um, the best technology there is. Um, we'll make it work and, and we'll do the job uh, to the best of our abilities. Now, Jim Ryan says that the Penobscot Regional Communication Center has already seen a 14% increase in the number of calls that it seems since, uh, over year to year. And just last month, they added Arusta County onto its call services, so he anticipates that it will go up even more. John Turner and Jamie Hatch love being out in Cobbs Cook Bay. They fish the waters, collect mussels there, and now monitor buoys the state has placed there. Set the, set the buoy out that we've marked on our GPS. The buoys are part of a monitoring program the Department of Marine Resources started in the past few years, first in Casco Bay and now in Cobbs Cook Bay. I mean, I have people say to me all the time, well, oh, you know, we're getting, you know, 20 more days of clamming in because... Using muscles attached to the buoy, scientists are able to tell whether there's red tide in the water. Red tide is a toxic algae that infects shellfish and can be deadly to humans. It doesn't take many muscles to be sick. If the toxin shows up in the water, the state shuts down the area to hundreds of fishermen. There have been land test sites for years, but the department has found water testing helps cut down on the number or size of red tide closures. And it was nice for them because a lot more got opened. Mm -hmm. We kept a lot more right. because we could get into these little places where they go by boat. 
mm -hmm. where you can't get in from land. Mm -hmm. Before, they would just shut it down. But in the past two weeks, three of the 15 buoys in Cobscook have disappeared. We're going to go over to Estes Head and put a, replace a buoy that was there that is, was lost. The buoys that are gone and that Turner and Hatch are replacing are called Estes Head, Lincoln and Park. Two of them are at the mouths of bays. One of the biggest concerns that they have if a buoy is cut is they lose three weeks of data. And in that time, if red tide shows up on shore, they have to close the rest of the bay as well. Once we lose that ability to see what's going on, we have no choice but to go with the big closures again like we had done in the past. Kucher isn't sure what has happened to the buoys, but she says it's very apparent they have been cut. Turner says people may not realize the impact of their actions. And you figure 4th of July coming, people are, tourists are here, they want clams, the restaurants want clams, they want mussels, so there's more to the big picture that I think people are seeing. For now, they'll replace the buoys, continue to gather data, and hope there isn't a lot of red tide, and that the buoys in the water now will stay there. Well, it seems like everyone using Twitter these days, from politicians to celebrities to television stations like ours. Now add to that list second graders. That's right, the microblogging site that lets people get news, keep in touch with friends and colleagues, and share events of the day is now in the hands of eight-year-olds. We'll show you what's happening in a room eight of Asa Adams School. We're going to go check our Twitter account this morning as a class. Some Two months ago, if Mrs. White said this in her classroom, she'd get a bunch of blank stares. Now, every student's eyes light up. Does anybody remember the name of the class in Green, Maine that we're Twittering with? Debbie White's second grade class at Asa Adams School in Orono is exchanging tweets exactly. or Twitter messages with Tim Thompson's second grade class at Green Central School. Uh, Claire, can you read this? Hi, my name is Morgan. I have three dogs. Well, I like talking to our friends and it makes, it's like you're getting new connections to make new friends. White says she got interested in using the microblogging site in her classroom after she heard about an eighth grade class writing a story on Twitter. She knew there were lessons in the website for her students. Teaching writing is very difficult, but it's an essential skill. It's how we communicate primarily um, as humans and more and more so with the digital world because most of our communication that way is through writing. The kids caught right on. The first time I was just like, it's just some instant messaging blog, but now that I'm actually Twittering, I did it myself and I've done it more, I really like it. You get to talk with people. Like you get to see what they're doing and then type in what you're doing and then they write back what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Then you kind of have this little connection. Instead of talking to each other, you can just type. It's like pen pally. While most of the students are early adopters of the technology, some are more hesitant. You might, um, on the computer, you could um, accidentally press the wrong letter, then you'd have to go back. A proofreading lesson goes along with every tweet. White adds Twitter doesn't just motivate our students to write, it helps her teach them about online safety and digital citizenship. And that begins that whole modeling and that whole piece of what we're going to share online. We're not going to share a picture of us being incredibly goofy unless that's the point of what we're doing. There's also lessons in math. Twitter messages have a limit of 140 characters and spelling. Sing Brooklyn. And the students learn about things that weren't on the lesson plan. Last week, Mr. Thompson's class was learning about Wilma Rudolph, something not on Mrs. White's curriculum. Do you think we would have learned about Wilma Rudolph if we hadn't been Twittering? No. So while Twittering might be thought of as something for adults and teenagers, these students say no way, it's for us too. Giving them one more door to information and learning. Now, the classes have been tweeting one another since mid-February, and while they Twitter as a class, students also Twitter on their own, and both classes have blocked their Twitter pages, and no one can follow them unless they're approved. They are absolutely fantastic, and they're having a lot of fun. Yeah, so now you Twitter, too, so you get a Twitter yep. with them at all? I, I have been approved. <laughs> <laughs> okay.